Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fall virtual Medicaid fair. We're delighted to have everyone with us and hope that this day is enjoyable and very informative. Today, we wanted to cover with you what's new. The main thing we want to talk about is our chat bot, bot feature. In our, in our efforts to implement innovative ideas, uh, we think that this item will benefit everyone from an overall productivity and a quality to our provider or member uh, call center experience. We'll be implementing the chat box feature as early as yesterday, October 27th. So look for those new things uh, to come to you. What we have here today is we have uh, the location um, this enhancement will be located and accessed with your Georgia Medicaid Management System, the GA MMIS, and will be available 24 by 7. Some benefits of the chat box, bot is the chat bot will enhance users' experience by offering uh, quick answers to frequently asked questions, which will eliminate your need to speak to a live agent. This will make a positive impact to the provider member community during all times. Um, some of the features will include uh, to providers, how do they, uh, how do I change my address? How do I reset the MMIS password? How do I update owners, NPI, social security, or their tax ID? From a member perspective, it'll assist with resetting their MMIS uh, password. It'll also help them with how do they apply for Medicaid? And where do I go to renew my Medicaid? We're looking forward to this new enhancement and hope that it's useful to you as well. What we've included here today is how do you get to the chat bot? So you'll see the link at the top under visit. And this screen that is shown here below will illuminate uh, once you select that link. Next, I like to, uh, uh, when you need assistance, we're here to help. And what we have today listed here is our provider relations field rep uh, individuals. So I'd like to go over those names with you. Um, under Territory 1 in North Georgia, that's Mercedes Lindell. Number 2. Under uh, Fulton County is DeAndre Murray. Uh, under number three, our territory three in Northeast Georgia is Carolyn Smith. Uh, number four, Northwest Georgia, which is currently vacant. Uh, territory five is in Southeast Metro, um, and that's Ebony Hill. Um, Territory six, which is middle Georgia. Is Chantel Bradshaw. Territory seven, which is in Augusta and surrounding areas, Jessica Bowen. Territory eight, which is southwest Georgia is Jill McCrary. Territory nine is southeast Georgia, Kendall Telfar. Telfair, excuse me. Uh, Territory 10, which is South Georgia, is Andreas Johnson. And our South uh, Hospital Rep is Janie Griffin Weaver. And our Hospital Rep in the North is Sharita Bentley. Our in house support reps are Crystal Gordon, Haley Guyton, Tierra Johnson, Brandon Stewart and Kaylin White. We also have statewide uh, consultants. They're Sheree Daniels, Brenda Hewlett, and Danny Williams. Assisting in provider enrollment and CBO field reps, Auburn Woods, Hawkins in the north, and Darlene Bonner in the south. Additionally, I'd like to introduce you to our Gamewell Provider Relations Leadership Team. The manager of that organization is Stephanie Clayton. 
and the supervisor of provider relations is Sharana Strong. I wanted to share with you today some uh, service metrics that we've accomplished since we last met with you in the spring. So this period will cover April the 1st through October the 1st of this year. On our provider relations team and outreach, we've made over 10,000 provider contacts. This includes emails, phone calls, virtual workshops, and virtual visits. In our contact center, we have received over 424,000 calls and over 8,000 portal requests and written correspondence that have been processed. In our provider enrollment unit, we are currently processing applications within 10 days of receipt. And with our CVO business, we're currently at 31 days. During this last six month time period, we've received over 10,000 applications for enrollment and over 5,700 CBO applications. In addition to that, we have revalidated over 5,000 uh, revalidations with providers on those applications. And we really appreciate that. This is a very important uh, undertaking that we're doing is going through revalidation. So we appreciate everyone on the phone and representing your provider group uh, to assist us with this revalidation. If you get phone calls, information on the portal, things of that nature, that you act on those uh, as quickly as possible. And up the over uh, 5,600 we received, we currently approved a little over 5,100 of those applications. So thank you for your involvement in that area. Going on to the other operational areas, we're currently processing um, resolutions and adjustments in one, within one day. Um, from an adjustment perspective for cash receipts and paper adjustments, we processed over 3,200. Suspended claims uh, reviewed and processed over 92,000. In our data capture mailroom area, we have sent out over 1.2 million outgoing letters. And the number of publications that have been mailed are over 40,000. Total claims data captured over 4,000. Some reminders that we'd like to remind you of was that effective on May 20th, our EFT payments uh, started being deposited on Thursdays. We also have presentations that will be uploaded on the GA MMIS web portal by close of business tomorrow. So all the present pre presentations we have today will be on the portal uh, by tomorrow. We'll also have the sessions FAQs will be uploaded within two weeks. We've also included a link for you to access um, the presentations and frequently asked questions. So that's noted here as well. And it'll be in the provider information and provider notices section. We also thought it might be helpful to provide some additional uh, resources. We have the link here for banner messages. So if you need to look back on previous banner messages, things of that nature, this is the link that you would use. We also have the link out for the DCHI newsletter. So you'll be able to look at that and previous uh, publications of that. To subscribe or request to be added to the DCHI distribution, use the link below or email at DCH. Well, I missed a very important item at the very beginning of the presentation. I didn't introduce myself, so my apologies for that. I'm Cheryl Collier, and I am the account executive responsible for all the Gainwell activities and partnering with the agency to make our uh, system and uh, your system as user friendly as possible. I really appreciate you attending today, and now I'll turn it over to Ryan Loke, our deputy commissioner. Thanks, Cheryl, for, for taking the time this morning to pull all this together and the entire Gainwell team for, for putting on the fall virtual Medicaid fair this year. Um, my name is Ryan Loke, and I'm the deputy commissioner and chief health policy officer at DCH. And, and in that role, I have the, the distinct honor and privilege to work 
um, with the Medicaid team under the leadership of, of Lynette Rhodes and Dr. Holloway and Brian and Catherine Ivey uh, and all of their staff that work day in and day out uh, to support you guys and to support the little north of two and a half million Medicaid members that we have in the state of Georgia. Um, I also have the opportunity to, to work with Lewis Amos, who's our state health benefit plan director. Um, and I've been privileged to work at DCH coming up on a little bit north of four months now. Um, prior to this, uh, I had another role in the administration advising on health policy, but not new to the DCH team. Got to work with them for three years before this, but excited to, to be in this role and come over um, with Commissioner Noggle uh, and her staff um, in, on July 1st of this year. I'm going to run through a, a couple quick slides uh, with you guys today. Um, can I talk a little bit about uh, Commissioner Noggle and her priorities, a little bit of the Medicaid priorities and some things that we've got going on? Um, and then let you guys get to the, the breakout sessions. As I was talking to, to the Gainwell team earlier this week, it sounds like we've got a little north of 600 providers registered um, to attend various breakout sessions today, which is great to hear. Um, and, and I hope you guys will, will take advantage of those um, later this afternoon. And I hope um, the next time that we get to do one of these, it's going to be in person. It looks like COVID um, is subsiding pretty substantially in the state. So maybe maybe come springtime, we'll get to, to meet each other and be with each other in person. So. Again, thank you guys for, for being here today. I'm going to click through a couple slides and then, then get you on your way. So we'll we'll jump ahead to the agenda slide if that works for you, Cheryl. Yep. So like I said, you know, talk a little bit about current priorities, um, some of the procurements that, that are ongoing and about to begin that will impact you guys. A little bit about Medicaid enrollment and, and what we're seeing and then end with uh, a discussion on provider revalidation, which is incredibly important. Uh, for us and for you guys to continue serving the populations that you serve. So before we jump into the, the current priorities of Medicaid, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what the current priorities um, of, of DCH are under Commissioner Noggle and, and her new leadership um, coming in, like I said, on, on July 1st of this year. Um, we, we had the opportunity to, to work with her from um, the previous Commissioner Frank Berry and his team. Um, I, I spent probably Gosh, you know, six to seven hours a day, every single day for 18 months um, with Commissioner Barry uh, in a small conference room um, dealing uh, with some incredibly complex questions and decisions around the state's operational response to COVID. Um, hate that that he stepped out and into the private sector, but, um, you know, loved every second of getting to, to work with him and learn from him and learn all of the folks uh, on the Medicaid team as well about some things that were going on. Um, you know, coming into this role, you know, our first and foremost priority was, was to enhance and improve the customer service and customer experience of the agency. Um, you know, we, we're in a position now where we're trying to assess, and, and Cheryl has done a great job at the beginning showing some of those metrics. You know, how are we judging success a, as an enterprise? You know, are we, are, are we processing claims in a timely manner? Are we answering the phones in a timely manner? Are we getting back with accurate and, and timely information in a timely manner to all of the various parties and partners and vendors and, and stakeholders and legislators and, and folks that we serve in the state of Georgia, um, you know, first and foremost was to improve and, and measure the success of customer service and customer experience. I think some of the things that Cheryl and her team um, have got ongoing and will be ongoing um, over the course of the next couple of months are, are evidence of that. I hope you will start to see some of that as well and some of the other partners and vendors that, that DCH uses. Um, the, the second piece, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but is to have a tenant of quality in, in everything that we do. Um, very quickly, when we came in in July, we were tasked with coming up with a one of a kind, innovative approach to skilling facility quality payments, um, and had the opportunity to work with very quickly Daphne Kite uh, and her team over at the Office uh, of Analytics and Program Improvement to craft a, a very unique. Uh, skilled nursing quality proposal that rewards uh, improvement on the skilled nursing side from a provider standpoint and, and quality improvement. Um, and, and we're going to continue that kind of notion about focusing and, and hyper focusing really on quality, both within you know our care management organizations, but also our providers. Um, and again, you know, the customer service and customer experience metrics as well. Everything is going to have a quality focus uh, that the department does um, kind of moving forward and, and here on out. And the last tenant that, that Commissioner Noggle is very keen on um, is using data to, to make decisions. Um, you know, we, we as DCH cover a little north of, of 3 million lives between 
uh, the Medicaid population and the state health benefit population just south of, of 33% of, of Georgia's total state population. We have an incredible amount of data from, you know, claims information and encounters and, and interactions um, and, and outcomes and so on and so forth. And we want to be able to use that incredible amount of data uh, to, to really drive the decision making um, moving forward across all various and, and myriad areas of DCH. And, and you'll start to see uh, some of that roll out over the course of, of the next couple of weeks. Um, we're going to be looking at some unique things uh, on the care management organization side. Um, and again, kind of continuing that effort on the skilled nursing side. So more to come on that. But those are kind of the three big tenets um, that, that we are focused on right now from a strategic priority perspective of improving customer service and customer experience, having a tenet of quality in everything that we do, and then using data uh, to make decisions. So moving on to the, the Medicaid current priorities, and, and thanks, Carol, for, for pushing that slide forward. I'm going to talk about six of these just briefly, and, and there are various breakout sessions uh, throughout the day on, on a couple of these, but but each of these have a, a tenet in kind of the three overarching administration priorities that we're pushing around, you know, COVID-19, the public health emergency, um, you know, maternal and infant mortality and what we're doing on the postpartum front, our quality strategy that, that Dr. Holloway and his team have done yeoman's work um, to, to get across and approved by CMS, um, getting electronic ver vis visit verification up and running under the leadership of Brian Dowd and his team, um, some of the procurements that are going on on the NEMT side and the gamma side, and then I want to talk about the CMO procurement as well. So we'll go to the next slide and talk about the public health emergency and COVID-19. There we go. Um, so the, as you guys are, are well aware, um, since uh, I believe February or March of 2020, um, there has been a national public health emergency that the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared, and that gave um, both the federal government, state government, and, and various entities um, a series of executive powers that, that didn't exist before and, and leeways and regulations and, and waivers and, and, and other things that really allowed us to respond both effectively, but also quickly and nimbly to the, the COVID pandemic as it was developing as well. Um, and, and that public health emergency, you know, gave us the ability to allow for certain, you know, waivers of telehealth rules, um, enrollment and revalidation rules, and, and allows us as well um, to, to keep Medicaid members on the rolls throughout the duration of the public health emergency. Uh, the most recent extension occurred a uh, week before last, I believe, um, and last uh, through January 16th of this year. We expect it'll probably be extended one more time. Um, we think that they, they need that um, to allow for uh, vaccine approvals at, on the FDA side and some regulatory functions that the federal government needs. We need it as well. Um, to allow us to, again, respond to, to um, as quickly and nimbly as we can, uh, changes in the COVID environment, and it allows us to have a, a real amount of flexibility uh, within our Medicaid program to meet the needs of the members and the providers that we serve. Um, <clears throat> we have done a fairly robust job on the Medicaid side of, of getting uh, vaccines administered um, quickly in, in, into the Medicaid members that we serve. I want to call out one thing that um, we opened up uh, a code for um, preventative Medicaid medicine counseling on the vaccine side uh, in September of this year. That's retro back to July 1. Um, and it allows providers to bill um, for talking to their members um, and, and to their patients, to the families that they serve about the COVID vaccine, the importance of the COVID vaccine, and the efficacy of the COVID vaccine. Um, I, I want to thank, you know, Brian and, and his team for helping us get that over the finish line. And I think that's really and I'll show you the metrics on the next slide, um, that's really led to an increase uh, in the number of vaccines that have been administered um, in the Medicaid population. Another thing that I wanna hit on, um, and you guys know this better than, than anybody on the face of the planet, but the importance of well child visits and, and immunizations. We saw, and, and we've got data to, to back this up, and it's, it's startling to see a dramatic drop off in the number of, of well child visits and immunizations um, that occurred, particularly on the low income Medicaid side, um, and, and we've got to find a way to, to get that back. And, and as folks are kind of adjusting or returning to a new normal, making sure that both through our care management organizations, but also through you guys as well, that we're reaching out to families, that we're reaching out to members and making sure that folks are coming in for their well child visits, that they're getting their immunizations to go to school um, and that everybody is, is healthier and, and safer as a result of that. Uh, the public health emergency as well. 
allowed us to to provide for certain waivers um, related to to telehealth. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily a huge proponent of telehealth prior to coming into this role, but getting to spend a little bit of time w- with our team and hear from you guys, you know, the the usage and and the applications of, of telehealth have expanded tremendously, and it's our absolute intent to keep a lot of this in place post the public health emergency going away. Um, and I'm working with with Lynette and her team right now to make sure that we've got the capabilities in place to continue that, because that obviously is is the way of the future. I had a telehealth visit for the first time uh, two or three weeks ago and, and was amazed at, at the capabilities and the conversations um, that were occurring. And so we're gonna do our best to keep most of that in place uh, to the extent that we can once the public health emergency expires. And then the last thing, and, and again, you guys know this better than anybody, you know, social determinants of health and COVID, COVID really has exacerbated um, the disparities that exist, um, particularly in our Medicaid population around social determinants of health. Um, and in our conversations with the federal government and the new administration and CMS, everything that DCH does and, and interacts with on the federal government side, whether we want an approval on a state plan amendment, or a rate adjustment or a waiver or anything like that, it has to have core tenants related to social determinants of health and equity. And so over the next couple months or so, you're gonna see us have a, a really, really hyper focus on ensuring, you know, through our care management organizations, but also through you guys as well, uh, a real focus around the entirety of social determinants of health from access to food, housing, transportation, support, behavioral health, so on and so forth down the line. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna have a, a hyper focus on that just to make sure that that we are not um, leaving behind what we've learned from the pandemic and and how it's impacted, uh, particularly our, our low income Medicaid population. So, when we go to the next slide, Cheryl. And and like I said, this is a little bit of the the COVID nineteen vaccine data um, on the Medicaid side. This is put together um, by Daphne Kite and her team at, at OAPI, and is posted on the DCH website. I think it's updated every week or every other week. Um, you can see that we've got a little north of a half million um, Medicaid members who have received at least one dose of the vaccine, uh, 465,000 who are fully vaccinated, and that's a little south of a third of the total Medicaid population. That's less than, than Georgia's um, overall vaccination rates. I think on Tuesday, we crossed the 50% threshold of the total population of, of Georgians who are, um, who are eligible to get a vaccine who are fully vaccinated. Um, you know, there, there's obviously hopefully going to be a bump um, over the next several weeks as uh, kids 5 to 11 are, will likely hopefully be able uh, to get vaccinated. I know that those um, codes and, and the various vaccine counseling and everything associated with that are already loaded into the system. So as soon as CDC says go, you guys are ready and, and we're ready to support you in that. So next slide, please share. Talked a little bit about um, maternal and infant mortality, and, and it's no secret to, to anybody that Georgia's maternal and infant mortality rates are are abysmal and, and in fact worse in the nation. I think we're 50th and 49th, uh, depending on whose report and whose whose metrics uh, that we use. Um, the, the General Assembly, and its wisdom, uh, I believe, the year before last, um, allowed for an extension of postpartum coverage um, for for Medicaid moms to hopefully help address. Um, and, and provide some level uh, of tool to, to help us um, combat the maternal mortality issues that, that we are seeing in this state. Um, our, the previous state plan allowed for Medicaid coverage 60 days after birth for Medicaid moms and, and under our 1115 postpartum waiver that was approved in April of this year, we got that out um, to another four months. So six months of total coverage uh, postpartum for Medicaid moms. We're working right now uh, under some federal authority to see if we can extend that out to a year. Uh, and I think if we can do that and, and the, the budget is allowed for from the General Assembly, we'll be able to make really some tremendous strides uh, in that effort. Um, but you guys know, I mean, Medicaid covers a little north of 50% of all births in the state of Georgia and, and you know, providing not only coverage, but the wraparound services associated with it um, is incredibly important. And we're gonna be measuring this uh, moving forward to ensure that Hey, if, if we're not doing something right, or if there's another service that can be provided, or if we can have, you know, more players in the space to help, uh, you know, get folks 
um, the, the right amount of, of coverage and, and going to their postpartum visits and doing well child visits and so on and so forth down the line um, that we're really going to make a, a tremendous impact uh, on the maternal mortality situation. Right now, because of the public health emergency, as you guys know, nobody is, is terminated from Medicaid unless they move out of state or, or, or they unfortunately pass away. Um, so, in effect, uh, postpartum coverage ha has been in place for um, for more than, than six months since that time. But once the, the public health emergency expires, our current program uh, will allow us for uh, six months of continuous coverage after delivery. So, next slide, please, Cheryl. Mentioned a little bit about the kind of core tenant around the around quality and, and everything that DCH does, and, and Dr. Holloway. Uh, and his team did a, a tremendous amount of, of really great work of advancing our required um, federally required quality strategy up to CMS that got approved um, last month. You know, our goal with this is, is really, you know, to improve health outcomes, improve care coordination, you know, around the disease management side and, and tackle some of those health disparities and the social determinants of health that we talked a little bit about earlier. That um, quality strategy is posted on the DCH website. It's quite lengthy. Um, but I, I would encourage you guys to take a chance to peruse at least through the executive summary of it, because um, it really provides a, a, a real strong roadmap um, for how Medicaid and the agency is going to plan for and operate uh, moving forward over the next three fiscal years. So next slide, please, Cheryl. Electronic visit verification. E everybody on here is likely aware of this. Um, Brian Dowd and, and his team have been working Gosh, probably 18 to 20 hours a day, every day for the last several months, um, preparing us for the uh, November 1st required date to, to go live and start submitting claims um, through the system. Uh, I, I know that they have been working hard, like I said, because I got an email from Brian at 830 last night. Um, and so I know that that y'all have been aware of and, and working with his team to, to get things in place. There is a breakout session that starts at 9 today that I would encourage uh, folks to, to join if they've got questions, um, because it's, it's incredibly important. It's federally required, um, and we're in a position to start November 1st. So if you've got questions about that, breakout session at 9 is the place to go. Next slide, please, Cheryl. A little bit about procurements. Um, my, my favorite topic, and, and probably some of y'all's favorite topic as well, I'm going to touch on the four big ones. Uh, that that will impact you guys and give a little bit of perspective on on where I think we're headed and, and some timelines as well. Um, first and foremost, our our care management organizations, our CMO procurement, um, the big Kahuna, if you will. Um, at at present, our CMO contracts are set to expire on June thirtieth of twenty twenty four. So we will have to have um, new contracts in place on July first, twenty twenty four. We are working uh, right now. Um, with Lynette and her team and, and a whole bunch of folks uh, in DCH and also folks at DFACS and DHS and our behavioral health entity uh, and public health and external stakeholders and partners and so on and so forth to craft the next round of, of CMO procurement. The last time um, this went out to bid was 2015, 16, 17 timeframe. Um, and, you know, we're in a position to really try and, and transition the care management organizations away, and, and if they, they're on this call, I'll tell them this to this, their face as well, um, away from kind of this notion of, of a cost management organization back into what they were designed to be, which is a care management and a care coordination um, mechanism. And so we're working uh, with some incredibly smart folks right now to think about and, and learn about what other states are doing successfully in the space, what they're not doing successfully in the space, review internally with, with our partners and our team you know, what's going well, what's not going well, and then design an RFP that will go um, out on the street sometime in the next 18 months um, that will hopefully be best to serve Georgia's Medicaid population on the low income side uh, beginning July 1st of 24. And so more, more to come in that space, but know that, that we are uh, taking an incredibly hard look at that and making sure that the provisions both um, within the RFP or the RFQC uh, and then within the contract as well are, are meeting the tenants around customer service and customer experience and quality and data um, and incorporating all those provisions within Dr. Holloway's quality strategy as well. And you'll start to hear and see more uh, about this moving forward. It's our hope that, that we get to invite 
many of y'all into this process and provide your feedback on your interactions with the CMOs and what could be improved and what's going well and what you want to see uh, in the next contract and in the next RFP. So more to come on that, um, but know that we are taking an incredibly uh, hard look and, and tremendous focus on that. Next one is non-emergency medical transportation. Um, took a second to, to get us to this point, but now we're, we've gotten uh, the RFP out. We've got responses back. Uh, the team is reviewing those responses right now. Um, can't say much about it, but but more to come hopefully here shortly on that. Next one is, is pharmacy benefit manager. Um, we have just really started the process of re re-procuring our PBM on the fee-for-service side. Um, we're working with a consortium of other states under the auspices of something called NASPO um, to help kind of bring market forces to bear and, and work and collaborate with other states um, to get the best fee-for-service fee PBM in place. And, and again, just like with the CMO uh, procurement, you know, learning what other states are doing well, what they're not doing well, what's innovative, what's, you know, kind of forefront on, on the market leader's mind. Um, more to come on that as well, but, but excited uh, particularly about that one. And then the last one um, is our MMIS system. Um, we are in process right now of of building out, and it's a it's a multi year federally required process to to re procure and, and redesign our MMIS system into what are called modules. Um, and so the idea behind this is to be able to build um, almost like, like Lego blocks, if you will, um, various components of our MMIS system that that will work and coordinate with each other um, and hopefully you know, provide that level of customer service and customer experience that, that you guys expect um, as providers in this space and, and really you know, design a, a program that's you know, member friendly, provider friendly, and then certainly scalable as well. So a lot going on on the procurement space um, over the next 18 months or so. Um, news here, hopefully shortly on NEMT care management organization sometime in the next 18 months, PBM sometime in the next few months, and then the MMIS is a multi-year thing, um, but announcements will, will be ongoing about that. So we hit the next slide, Cheryl. A little bit about enrollment trends and, and what we're seeing. Um, and again, this is no secret to you guys, since the, the public health emergency began, um, every state uh, who accepted the enhanced staff map, which, which was every state, um, has been unable to to terminate um, folks who are on the Medicaid rolls um, for for any reason except for moving out of state and death. So very limited circumstances. And so you can see that right when when COVID hit the state on on March second of twenty twenty, we were a little north of two point one million Medicaid members um, between uh, fee for service um, and and low income Medicaid. And right now we're just north as of last month of of two and a half million. Um, so a lot, the, the roles are, are certainly inflated, um, and we're in a position once the public health emergency expires, CMS has provided us guidance, um, that we've got a year to go through redeterminations of that. And so we're in process of planning what that looks like right now. It's certainly not the state's intent, um, to kick everybody off the second that the public health emergency ends. We want to make sure that we're doing, um, re-verifications in, in a manner that's both you know compliant with federal law but also allows for you know a little bit of flexibility on the member side um, and making sure that we're not just pushing people uh, kind of out into the ether unnecessarily but but making sure that we're doing this in a thoughtful and constructive manner um, those conversations are, are ongoing with defects and our advocate partners and, and everybody else so more to come on that but like i said uh, at the onset the public health emergency is, is still in place at least uh, through January 16th of this year. So next slide, please share. And the last thing that, that I want to touch on, and then I'll leave you with some thoughts, and, and this is incredibly important to you guys, um, is to revalidate your provider enrollment as soon as you possibly can. Um, and this, again, applies to individual practitioners at the facility level. Right now, we think there are about 120,000 providers. Um, that need to revalidate again, public health emergency allows us to have some flexibility in this space. But if you haven't had a chance to revalidate, go ahead and do that because the, the second, the PHE ends, um, you know, we're going to go through that place. And if you haven't revalidated that can result in suspension or termination from that, from Medicaid and chip. And we certainly don't want that to happen. You guys serve, uh, an incredibly important role in, in providing care for 25% of Georgia's population who are. Low income or disabled, um, 
And so please, 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 please go through your re revalidation process as soon as you can. So when we hit the last slide, Cheryl. So thank you guys for first and foremost, what, what you do every single day. I, I know it's, it's not always the most glamorous work. Um, it's not always the highest paying work, um, but it, it, it truly is the, the best work um, that providers can provide to Georgia's population uh, in the Medicaid space. And, and you guys serve an incredibly important role. And, and I personally am grateful for, for everything that you do each and every day to provide care and care coordination um, for the families and the kids um, that, that you guys serve. One thing that, that I will leave you with, and then I'll turn it back to Cheryl, if there are challenges or issues or opportunities, or you want to give kudos, I like good news as well, um, about your, your interactions with the Medicaid team or with DCH at large, or if you've got questions about other agencies or stuff going on in the state, please feel free to, to reach out to me at any time. Uh, my email is ryan.loke at dch.ga.gov. Um, and I can't promise you that, that I'll know the answer, but I, but I can promise you that I know somebody who will know the answer and will commit to getting back to you uh, with a response in a timely and, and accurate manner as best as we can. Um, you know, it's, it's our goal to, to continue um, to have these type of sessions, both within the Medicaid fair, but starting as well, you know, bringing in stakeholders and, and providers and care management organizations and everybody that interacts with us and, and really you know, take a deep look at, at to what DCH does and what DCH provides and, and improve upon or augment or, or shift direction or so on and so forth, um, the my myriad different operations that we do. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for what you do. If I can ever be of service to you or helpful to you and your teams, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. And I hope you guys have a great uh, Medicaid fair today. And with that, Cheryl, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate everything you said. That was certainly an uplifting and encouraging uh, presentation, and we're so glad you're with us um, today. Um, hope everyone has enjoyed their morning thus far. We're going to sign off now, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next uh, session today. Take care and have a great day.